Hello, welcome to this session. We're talking about water legislation on the ground flowing freely or clearly as mud. I love the title of this. We know that Europe's waters are increasingly affected by climate change and we want to have clean rivers. We want to have clean lakes and seas. To do that, we need to fully apply Europe's water rules. The legislation is actually there because the EU Water Framework Directive is there. It's a huge piece of legislation. Compliance is improving, but it's just not what it should be. I mean, it's showing some results, but not enough. The target is that 100% of the EU's freshwater ecosystem should be in good health by 2027, which is not far away. And at the moment, it's just 40%. So there is a lot to be done. So in this next hour, we're bringing together some key players to ask how we can move faster with implementation. We've got voices from the water industry, from farming and water inspectors. So it should be very interesting. Just to tell you that we will be doing a Slido poll in a moment. So please do make sure that you've got Slido open and ready. And of course, we'll be using Slido to take questions uh, from you for this session. But just open it ready for the poll while I introduce our speakers. So we have with us Carlo Chiaretti, who is head of policy at Euro, which is the European Federation for Drinking Water and Wastewater Operators. Um, so basically the voice of the water industry. Hello to you, Carla, representing something like 65,000 operators around Europe. Hello, good to see you. Uh, we have Samuel Mass, who is the president of SEJA, which is the European Young Farmers Organization. He is an organic wine grower near to Montpellier in the south of France. Stepped in right at the last moment. So thank you very much indeed. We're, we were going to hear from your vice president, but I think he, he wasn't uh, unable to join us. We're delighted to see you. We all wish that we were in the south of France, but never mind. <laughs> it's quite nice here in Brussels, so I can't really complain. Uh, we have uh, Jeroen November, who is also in Belgium. He's Environmental Inspector for the Government of Flanders, Department of Environment and Spatial Development. And you're going to be telling us a little bit more about um, tackling illegal groundwater drilling and abstractions, which is quite an issue around Europe um, in different places. And um, so you'll be telling us from a Flanders perspective, but thank you. Good to see you. And Paul Spate is here. Um, Paul's only half here, he tells me. He's the head of unit of DG Environment Enforcement Unit. So from the European Commission, but he said, I'm just here if you need me to answer some questions about legislation and things, but I reckon we'll need you quite a lot, actually, Paul. So I'm, we're very glad that you're here. So before we start our discussion, I want to ask everyone, the audience, a question on uh, Slido. This is a poll. It's in your country. What do you consider the most serious challenge with regard to water? Is it chemical pollution? Is it wastewater treatment? Is it water scarcity? Is it floods? Or is it dams and canals? So is it chemical pollution, wastewater treatment, water scarcity, flooding, or dams and canals? So I hope enough people have got their polo, their, their um, Slido open for the poll to be able to give us, a, I mean, at the moment, chemical pollution is, uh, but not many people have voted so far. We might, we, if we don't get, well, are we getting some results now? I was going to say, otherwise we could have a look at the results a bit later on. Um, so wastewater treatment and chemical pollution are coming up, but it's not, it's not, uh, not many people are voting. So we might come back to that, but we're looking at chemical pollution and wastewater at the moment as, and water scarcity as the big problems. Okay. Well, let, let's um, just start by hearing from some of our, um, well, all of our speakers, but let, let's start first of all. Uh, with Carla Chiaretti from Euro, um, basically from the water operators perspective, where do you see the, the biggest challenges in um, water legislation and its enforcement or not, Carla? Yes, thank you very much, Cathy, and you should be able to see the presentation, I hope. So, um, my name is Carla Chiaretti and uh, I work for Euro. Uh, Euro is the European Federation of Water Services and uh, the organization was established in 1975 when the majority of the members 
back then six uh, spoke French, as you could see, EAUO is water in French. Today we represent the 34 national organizations of drinking water and wastewater operators from 29 European countries. And within our membership, we have both the public and the private sector. We provide essential services. We contribute then to the realization of the human rights to water and sanitation. And by doing so, of course, we protect public health and the environment. The sector is rather uh, different from country to country and sometimes within the same country. So if you want to know more about how water services are organized, I would just direct you to the governance report that is on our website. When it comes to the water legislation, here is a very nice picture of all kinds of different pieces of legislation. As you said, Cathy, we have the Water Framework Directive that is the framework that gives the objectives that water bodies will have to comply with now by 2027. And there are all other pieces of legislation that really try to uh, contribute to attaining these objectives. We have the total directives, the groundwater directive, the priority substances directive for the protection of groundwater, for the protection of uh, surface water, but also, of course, what we call the water industry directives, the drinking water directive that was just revised and uh, entered into force, the new text entered into force in January, and then the urban wastewater treatment directive that will be revised next year. Um, of course, all other uh, pieces of legislation dealing with emissions to water uh, are also important. Um, but what we see is also that water implementation depends a lot on the implementation, on the correct implementation of other sectoral legislation. And uh, here, of course, we see a kind of um, mismatch because the water industry directives have a high level of compliance. Um, of course, there are specific challenges that I'm sure will be addressed um, by the urban wastewater treatment directive revision uh, next year. Um, at the same time, we know that there is a big challenge for the implementation of the water framework directive. Um, of course, the lack of political uh, will to tackle uh, this to uh, really promote the protection of water resources has been identified as a big problem by the fitness check. The fitness check also um, recognizes there is a problem of uh, financing water measures. Indeed, the directive is from 2000. There was uh, no specific impact assessment on the cost that this directive would bring about in order to achieve those objectives uh, within those timelines. Um, there is no EU water fund attached to really implement the water framework directive on EU level. And yes, what we see really as a core problem is the lack of coherence between the objectives of EU sectoral legislation, could be agriculture, but could be also energy, chemical, um, transport, uh, and the objectives of the Water Framework Directive. So unless there is a mainstreaming of the Water Framework Directive objectives in terms of really the philosophy to move forward, for, forward to, towards the protection of water resources, then the objectives will not be met. And we are very happy that the Commission published the Zero Pollution Action Plan that focuses on source control and really the philosophy behind is to reinstate the four environmental policy principles that are enshrined in the EU treaty. The precautionary principle, the principle that preventive action should be taken, that the environmental damage has to be rectified at the source and the polluter pays. And of course, um, we, we know that uh, the, the commission has um, uh, also uh, reflected this in the hierarchy of measures that you can uh, have a look at in the, um, in, in the Zero Pollution Action Plan. And from the water sector, I would like just to mention two provisions where the lack of implementation is really um, uh, alarming for the water sector. 
the implementation of Article 7, Paragraph 3, that really imposes a general obligation on member states to protect water bodies with the aim of avoiding deterioration and also to reduce the level of purification treatment required in the production of drinking water. Uh, as of today, I haven't met a single water operator that has not been obliged to increase the treatment to produce drinking water that compliance with um, the, the uh, health requirements in the drinking water directive. This means uh, more energy um, consumption, but also a higher water bill for the consumers. And this entails also a concern for the affordability of the water bill. We are not just talking about all pollution, like a fertilizer or pesticides, but also what we call emerging pollutants or pollutants of emerging concern, like PFAS, for instance. And here, I think it's really time to move forward and apply the polluter pays principle and not the water consumer pays principle. And then the second provision is uh, really Article 9, and of course this follows a bit, because Article 9 um, requires um, that member states take into account the cost recovery principle for water services, including environmental and resource costs, and in accordance with the polluter based principle. Member states shall ensure that water pricing policies also provide adequate incentive for users to use water efficiently, and also member states shall ensure that adequate contribution of different water uses, industry, households, and agriculture to the recovery of the cost of water services, and also taking into account the polluter pays principle. Water consumer pays for, pay for the water bills. What about the other users or uses? But still, we want to look at the bright side and also look at the positive development, the zero pollution action plan and the philosophy behind it for sure. The work that is carried out at the expert groups of the commission that uh, uh, the geo environment has set up under the uh, water industry unit, but also the work of the um, common implementation strategy of the uh, Water Framework Directive. It is really, I think, a unique experience where member states cooperate with the Commission and stakeholders at EU level in order to advance in the implementation of the Water Framework Directive. And we are very happy that uh, uh, the Commission is partnering with the OECD to improve the implementation of Article 9. Um, so talking about cost recovery and polluter base. There was also a very interesting experience of cooperation. There was a task force set up between water and agriculture uh, people from uh, the last commission. And uh, it was an interesting attempt to um, at least to discuss the problems. And also we appreciate the Court of Auditors work on water. And of course we welcome stakeholders engagement. We have a lot of positive engagement at national, but also local level with other sectors. So this is my presentation. I'm really looking forward to a very nice discussion. Thank you very much indeed, Carla. Uh, can I just pick up on uh, when you say that the lack of implementation of legislation at national level, particularly the protection of water bodies, um, what is, why is there such reluctance? At na is, is, it, is it just very difficult for, uh, the, for this legislation to be enforced? Uh, why is there a, a reluctance at, at member state level? Well, of course, it requires, I think, a very clear political decisions. And this is not always, uh, this hasn't been always um, very much um, liked by uh, politicians. But still, I hope today with this um, new Green Deal and uh, the youngsters that are really marching in the street on Friday, um, that you know, there is a new political momentum to bring about this political will. Great. Well, thank you very much indeed. So let's now hear the, the voice of, of the farming community, Samuel Mas. I mentioned that uh, you're a wine grower in France. So g give us a sense um, from the young farmers uh, in Europe where you stand on this. In, because obviously farmers need clean rivers, 
but uh, often the finger is pointed at farmers in terms of, of the runoff from fields that is polluting uh, water sources and this sort of thing. So g g what's your perspective on this? Yeah, thank you very much, Katie. Thank you to everyone and good afternoon. Uh, thanks a lot for the invitation. Eh? Uh, I hope you can hear me well. Uh, so, um, so, yeah, that's a, an extremely an important subject, eh, which is the subject of water today. This subject is important for several reasons, but I will come back to it uh, after introduce a little bit better because you did a little bit, but I would like to go uh, and explain. So you said that I'm president, which is true of CEJA. Eh? So we represent 2 million young farmers across Europe. Um, and, but you said also, and I'm an organic uh, wine grower, uh, so located uh, in the south of France near Montpellier. And so on 20 hectares of vines, I work with my brother Geoffrey. And so in 2018, uh, we, um, we started to produce our own bottles, but still the biggest part of our production goes to the cooperative uh, winery on which we are members. So since the beginning, uh, we have been very committed to an agricultural practices in order to promote biodiversity through several measures that go far beyond the simple specification of organic farming. And if you want later, I could come back to that because I have a lot of things to say related to this subject. And you will tell me uh, that is not necessarily the subject of today's discussion, but in fact it is. Uh, and at the beginning, I said that the subject of water was important for us farmers in several aspects and let me be more explicit. So, so for several years uh, now, we have been in the front line of a climate disruption and climate change is a reality that we face every day and it's reflected, uh, reflected in an intensification of episodes uh, in terms of duration and violence. I will give you two recent examples. On June 26, uh, 2019, in my region and on my farm, we faced an unprecedented heat wave that, with temperature uh, under shelter around 46 degrees Celsius. And this wave was just the culmination of a drought that affected all Europe. Even Scandinavian countries such as Sweden have faced uh, such a, a drought. And another example this year, uh, on April, we had a huge frost wave affecting 10 countries in Europe and destroying many crops. So that's just one little part of what is going on currently with the climate. And if I give you these two examples, it is because in both cases, water used in good condition, whether in the case of drought, uh, drought pardon, with drip irrigation or frost, by sprinkling the, to protect the buds from frost was necessary. So that's something related to agriculture at the same time. So unfortunately, asset, access to water is not guaranteed for farmers in Europe. And even though it is the key to ensure uh, our food sovereignty in some ways, I can say, but also the sustainability of farms and consequently the renewal of generation through the installation of young farmers, if you look at, at the end of the ID. And I'm talking about the issue of access to water, which will require investment in terms of infrastructure to allow access, but also in research or innovation to limit its consumption. Today, new technologies already allow us to define the best time to irrigate or also the right quantity in order to limit the pressure on water resources that it's fragile. And especially in area where there is a most uh, demand eh? And the great solution could be using wastewater uh, as a holistic approach. But this could be a solution if, of course, we filter it before in order to avoid any pollution to the soil. Eh? So that's that could be a, a thing. And I think that we will come back to it later and it could be bring to, to some question, uh, to some question if we will not go further on this point. Uh, another very important issue, and you mentioned it, is water quality. In, in Europe, compared to other parts of the world, we have access to very good and rather affordable drinking water. However, and I cannot deny this, in some region and specifically in some rural localities due to agriculture, water pollution has an impact on the quality and sometimes making it unfit for consumption, but also, and more seriously, uh, harmful or even catastrophic action on the environment, mainly due to elements coming from fertilizers such as nitrates, nitrates or nitrates, or from pesticides, which leads to ecological disasters. Here too, we have a role to play, whether it is 
by putting in place uh, measures to reduce input, by planting grassy strips at the edge of watercourses or trees, by limiting or eliminating the spreading of liquid manure or other manure from livestock, or by eliminating certain mineral uh, fertilizers. Uh, these are easily leach, eh, etc. But also by changing practices or crop in water catchment area. So I will not be longer, but water is a common good necess uh, and necessary for agricultural because without water, we cannot grow plants to feed our animals of ourselves. It is a limited resources and we must preserve it and know how to share it. We must be able to develop water catchment area or water retention area in our territory to protect cities or villages from flooding or use the water for crop or an other activity necessary for economic activities such as, I will name some other golf courses, parks or other activities. Unfortunately, in many cases, the creation of hillside reservoirs or water retention dams or other infrastructure often encounter significant resistance from the population in various reasons, but for, for various reasons. And it is an important project. In order to achieve it, it is the thing that we co-construct this with the actor of the territory. This is very important, I think. And as a young farmer, but also as one of the generation committed to the future, I, I believe that we will have to achieve a carbon neutral Europe, yes, by 2050, while preserving the environment the water resources, resources, pardon, and a healthy, qualitative and accessible food. So thank you very much for listening to me. Voilà. Uh, Katie, I think you are muted. Sorry, I, I, I had been leaving my microphone on throughout. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Samuel, thank you. We heard from Carla from, from the uh, water industry about the, the necessity to, for, to have a sort of polluter pays approach to, uh, the, to, to water. And inevitably, there are pesticides, as you said yourself, and nitrates that, that are coming from, from farms. So do you think that more should be done than to, to to see farmers as polluters and to and to for you to have to pay more of a price for water so yeah to be very specific on this point um already in many cases when you buy any kind of fertilizer or pesticide you already pay a tax uh in in order uh, and to you know to to try to limit a little bit uh, you know in in term of uh, the use of this pesticide so that could be a, a thing to limit us but i think the best approach that we can have because i think uh for i would say um since 10 years farmers did a lot and i mean we can see now uh, uh, you know, diminution of use of fertilizers most of the times or pesticides. So, that, you know, we can see a big shift in terms of changes. And but there is other stuff coming. Uh, and if I take my own example as an organic farmer, you know, we use copper and we have to use more copper, for example, in order to protect our fruits. You know what I mean? And copper, it, it's it's I would say currently we don't have any other solutions to do so, but that's not the best solution also to, 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 to spray copper because that's, that's the worst scenario for environment. So that's one of the things that we have to make sure for tomorrow, how we will approach this point. And, and I, I think that by co-constructing with farmers, also the, the approach and also training, and maybe, like I said, innovation technologies and research could help us in order to, to limit the use of all these, um, elements that could pollute after that the resources so that's that's definitely the, the best way that we should do it in my okay. point of view okay thank you very much indeed samuel well we, we will talk some more in a moment just to tell you that the result from the first poll chemical pollution comes out at 44 percent wastewater treatment 38 percent this is in what you consider as the most serious challenge with regard to water let's do a second poll before we hear from um, Jeroen november um can we clear that poll and bring up another poll um, and this one is ranking from number one to number six. What do you consider the most efficient to ensure correct implementation of water rules? Is it better organization of and interaction between different actors? Is it capacity building for authorities? Is it making funds available to invest in compliances? Is it better enforcement at local level? Is it technical assistance for farmers and other stakeholders or digital solutions for better monitoring? So ranking from one to six, what do you consider to be 
the most efficient to ensure correct implementation of water rules. So and, oh, you have to, it'll take a while to do this. So I su suggest that while you're filling in, let me introduce uh, Jeroen, um, Jeroen November, um, Environmental Inspector from the Government of Flanders. So really, I mean, we're talking about implementation, Jeroen. This is, you know, it is your job. And I know that you're incredibly involved in uh, a, a European network of environmental inspectors who are working hard to implement and enforce European law together. So, Jeroen, t tell us a little bit more about that. Okay, thank you, Kathy. Well, being an environmental inspector looking at the poll, I know what I would vote for, but I'm I may be a bit biased, I guess. So, uh, but uh, good afternoon, everybody, and uh, welcome. Well, uh, also. Let me, let, before you start, then, in terms of of this, you, which poll are you talking about? The first one or the second one? No, the the, the second one. But I, I I'm I may not influence other people's votes. Well, you can right? you can tell us at the end then. I'll, I will. I will. The result. I will certainly tell you at the end. Yeah, I have no doubt. So I, I will having, be having my speech this afternoon on, on tackling illegal groundwater drilling and abstractions and the way we would like to approach that uh, in the IMPEL organization. Uh, just to start off, uh, for those of you who do not know what IMPEL really is, it's, it's as it says on the slide, it's an EU network for the implementation and enforcement of environmental law. So a, a speech on this is very much in place on, on this session as well. It's a, an international nonprofit organization uh, based in Brussels. Uh, I live in Belgium as well. Uh, founded in 1992, and we have a lot of member countries and organizations, as you can see there. And it's really uh, a network of practitioners in permitting and enforcement of environmental law. So the people are working in the field, environmental inspectors like myself. Uh, within this network, we, we have a lot of projects and we focus on, on five big thematic areas, which you can see there on the slide. And of course, Today, we will focus on water and land, which I am also part of. So within the water and land subject, we launched a project. We code named it TIGDA because we really love acronyms like everybody does. And TIGDA stands for Tackling Illegal Groundwater Drilling and Abstractions. So why, why did I think this project was, was important? Well, due to the, the, the drought we are being confronted with. And in Belgium, we have now our fourth, I hope, not the fifth consecutive year with a drought uh, on our hands. So. Uh, other than what's already mentioned in the Water Framework Directive, we know uh, what we have to do. Um, mainly because all the aquifers and aquitards which are drilled through in the member states for all different kinds of purposes, maybe groundwater abstraction, may also be geothermal, it's extremely important to manage this valuable resource for uh, the current generations and the generations to come, of course, because it's not only the water quantity, the groundwater quantity we have to protect, but also the groundwater quality. Um, for instance, over extraction may be, may be an issue, but also if you do not construct all these drillings or wells in a correct way, you may uh, induce uh, pollution in deeper aquifers via, via, cross, uh, via contamination from above. If you do not uh, fill up again a, a drilling hole after you drilled it with a bit of ceiling plug, for instance. So it is extremely useful for the enforcement guys, so to say, to, to, to get around the table and, and, and meet and talk and, and learn on what lessons are learned abroad to Europe, the good lessons as well as the bad, of course, and to see like what kind of legislation have, do you have in place for protection of these groundwater abstraction and drilling sites? And, and is it good legislation? Are there loopholes? Uh, is it enforceable or reg regulations? Because there's a lot of regulation in place which may or may not be enforceable and of course for us environmental inspectors that that may be an issue but also it's very useful to know like how do you really inspect all these installations like do you use risk-based targeting methods how do you check on flow meters for instance uh, do you use checklists and and whatnot very very useful information because if we're talking about illegal groundwater drilling abstractions it's really a, a black box in the system you know if you if you do not know what you're talking about. Well, you cannot include all these abstractions in your groundwater models. You, you cannot really guarantee whether or not you will attain a good status of your groundwater bodies. Uh, and, in, and in this issue, it's also important to know that by illegal groundwater drilling abstractions, we mean a non-permitted installation, so completely in illegal installations, as well as permitted installations, but not compliant. So for instance, a well which may have, be, have been permitted for 50 meters, but is in fact drilled 150 meters or tampering with flow meters and whatnot. So uh, interesting job, I can assure you. Um, 
what are the outcomes of the project? Well, we would like to produce uh, guidance documents, and these guidance documents, well, they can be they can be twofold. We can produce guidance documents on on legislation. What kind of legislation is enforceable and could we put in place for, for instance, groundwater abstractions, as you see over there? But we could also tailor that if there is a, uh, a lot of demand for that to other installations, for instance, geothermal drilling, which is really uh, booming throughout Europe, I guess, uh, through to the, the alternative energy sources we are trying to find, and geothermal is, is, is one of those. Uh, but also uh, groundwater abstraction uh, or, or groundwater dewatering uh, at, at construction sites is, is uh, a big issue well, over here in Belgium anyway, because it's, it's a lot of quantities of water which are being sometimes wasted at, at these sites. On the other hand, we could also uh, produce guidance documents on, on enforcement, like how do you enforce these installations? For instance, how do you check whether or not while drilling uh, they are doing their job in a correct way? Uh, how do you uh, install a flow meter in a correct way? And how do you check whether or not it is done and not tampered with? And maybe we can also produce uh, for the environmental inspectors checklists they can use throughout Europe if the legislation uh, allows this. How will we uh, go about uh, this issue? Well, uh, we see it as the, at this time as a, as a two-year project. So we started, in fact, I think uh, by the end of April, we had our kickoff meeting with like members from my guests, 15 to 16 different members from different countries. And we started drafting uh, a, a questionnaire uh, by which we will pose all these questions to the member states, like what kind of legislation do you have and, and what kind of guidance do you really need to do your job correctly? Um, that's what we are starting to draft and we will launch that before, before summer. Uh, we will also try to attract the, the attention of the scientific world by which we'll attend the 48th IH Congress, that's the International Association of Hydrogeologists Congress, which will be a live event, fortunately, in Brussels in September, uh, and where we'll hold there a workshop to see what the uh, other geoscientists think about, about this issue. Then after summer, we hope the questionnaire will be filled out by many, many, many people and we will uh, see what we what kind of replies we get and we will with the project group, we will decide on a, on a way forward. Then in 2022, so next year, we will hope that all this uh, Corona pandemic and COVID issues will be way, way, way behind us and we will start meeting face to face again. And we do hope to have some interesting site visits with the project group. And if they come to Belgium, I can assure you some breweries will be involved because breweries are, of course, one of the main, main, main users of groundwater in, in, in our country, at least. And we will start drafting the guidance documents I mentioned before and, and maybe also the checklist, if depending on the outcome of our questionnaire, of course. So uh, I, I would like to, to, to end my presentation here with a big shout out to you all, of course. So if you have anyone you know who would be interested in even or joining the project group or filling out our questionnaire or uh, who has knowledge about one of the techniques I mentioned, well, you're very welcome to contact us and then we will see where we will end up in the future. Uh, so with that, I uh, will end my presentation. Thank you very much indeed, Jeroen. And would you say then that, I mean, the difficulties that you're alluding to, is, does that feed into this sort of political unwillingness to do anything because politicians don't see the easy solutions in terms of enforcing water legislation? So they almost just turn a, turn a blind eye. Well, well, looking at the, at, the, at the Water Framework Directive, we know it has been deemed fit for purpose, of course, but it's, we also know it has been deemed a difficult piece of legislation and very complex, which had to be implemented in, in the different member states. But to be honest, if I look at other directives, I think the EU is doing a better job, not, I'm not saying a better job, but another job, like the, 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 the uh, industrial emissions directive there, the EU really states, well, you have to have an inventory of all installations and you have to rank them and you even have to have a plan on how to inspect them. So the highest risk installation have to be inspected each year, other, other installations every two years or other every three years, something like that. But now the EU is really giving, well, uh, not a really a free card, but, but inspections can be organized in all member states like they want to. It's, it's not really very strict regulation. So there is a lot of heterogene heterogeneity within, within the EU, I think, on, on how the enforcement is really done in the field. And, and that is, is not really good to have uh, a level playing field, so to speak, and, and some countries may be gold plating, some not, but it's, it's, it's part of the problem we have as enforcers. 
Okay, so you said that it, um, you, in terms of this poll, it was very straightforward for you. What should be number one? What would have been number one then? Well, of course, there should be there should be more more uh, means to, to to government because well, I work for a government office and we are like a lot of other government offices forced with government cutbacks and enforcement is not really on the on the top list, so to speak, of the politicians who have to decide on 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 delivering uh, large quantities of money or people to to enforcement. So, uh, giving that extra support and also support to the local level for enforcement uh, is is a good thing because in groundwater. Well, we see they have to inspect it also at a, at a local level, but these people at the local level, they have to do all kinds of things. And I have the luxury of being uh, of being occupied with groundwater like like 24 hours a day, but they have to do all different kinds of stuff. So for them, it's extremely difficult to even permit them or manage them. So we, we, we also need support from the higher level to this local level to do uh, an enforcement job so they can do it. So in terms of the poll, in fact, um, better organization of, and interaction between different actors came out as number one, but everything else, I mean, I think everybody thinks that nearly everything is equally equally uh, important. Having a look at that, um, there's not a great deal of difference. They're all considered to be important elements. Um, Paul, what's your view on this in terms of, and also what, um, on what we heard uh, Jeroen talking about the fact that you know for for local for national authorities it's a really tough job. Yeah, I mean it's not a simple uh, situation. I think no one would uh, no one would deny that. I mean one of the nice things about the panel today is you can hear the variety of challenges uh, that water uh, the water framework directive, but beyond that, I mean the water situation poses from north to south, uh, east to west. Uh, I mean in some places we're talking about droughts, in other places we could have been talking about floods or more um, nitrates, industrial pollution. So it is a, a challenge, and this is why, in a way, I mean there was never the water framework directive. It was never going to be a possibility to really say you know there's one size fits all it just doesn't you know on a, on a the EU is too varied for that and so you had to take account of that um, uh, variety but I think there were some really important points made up and things that we very much try to focus on in our um, in our implementation work I mean the point that your own made about governance you know this is very if you read for example some of our environmental implementation reports that we did in previous years last one was 2019 these governance points they come out really clearly you know how to organize are there enough resources put on you know is the is the, the member state well set up so that i think is a crucial one uh, and I also very much take the, you know, the, the point about the how, you know, do you have the technology? Is the, is the uh, research and is the investment going in? I think that's being discussed in other Green Week sessions. And then, of course, what we've tried to do in our uh, action to, to persuade the member states to take this seriously politically is very much uh, an integrated approach. So carrot and stick. Yeah, so we've tried to make quite a lot of money available. If you look at urban wastewater treatment over the years, billions of euro nearly spent uh, from EU funding uh, to, to member states to deal with this because it is expensive. No one, no one is denying that. And at the same time, you know, we have increasingly taken quite serious action. You know, we went right to fines. This is the very last step in the infringement process. We went right to fines on, uh, on open wastewater treatments and uh, we got very, very close at times on nitrates. So we have tried to, you know, take it very seriously and really push towards the uh, the implementation of this. Okay, thank you. Um, so Carla, uh, talking, talking about urban wastewater treatment, I mean, you were, you were saying what more needs to be done, um, more protection of the water bodies and this sort of thing. But in the meantime, the, the water industry itself has got its, you know, their own issues. I mean, as Paul was alluding, there are still wastewater treatments around Europe that are not up to spec and that, that, need, uh, that are in front of um, the European court, um, for the for the the, the, pro the problems with them, so the water industry has also got a responsibility to bear, hasn't it? Yeah, definitely. We are not denying, of course, um, that we have our responsibilities. But I also would like to draw your attention to the um, implementation report of the Urban Wastewater Treatment Directive. And of course, there is a 95% of compliance when it comes to the collection of wastewater. And I think it is 86% in terms of treatment. So uh, what the uh, challenges is uh, the challenges are today that the commission is looking at uh, when um, revising this legislation uh, they are looking at um, 
micro pollutants, so these uh, pollutants of a major concern, be uh, pharmaceutical residues, for instance, that uh, wastewater treatment plants uh, don't have the capacity to, to treat because they are simply not designed to, to treat them. Um, the, um, also, they are looking at the energy efficiency, they are looking at the circular economy aspect, and indeed, um, I'm happy uh, to tell Samuel that we finally have a regulation on uh, water reuse for agriculture, so there are minimum quality standards that uh, reclaimed uh, water, so treated wastewater uh, should have to be uh, reused in irrigation for agriculture purposes and um, different uh, quality for different uh, uses depending on the crop you are irrigating. Uh, this was passed last year. And um, um, also they are looking at, uh, for instance, overflows events um, when you have combined sewers um, because of heavy rains, because of uh, these uh, um, kind of water bombs that sometimes we, we experience and they are more and more um, common because of uh, uh, climate change. So the Commission is looking at all these weaknesses that uh, are not tackled today in the uh, Urban Wastewater Treatment Directive and they are trying to um, look how to address them in the new directive that will probably be proposed next year. And Samuel, you, you were talking about the potential for training for farmers or more communication. I mean, what, what, what more could be done? Uh, I mean, this came out as the number one in the poll that people thought that there should be more partnerships and, and, uh, and working together to understand different perspectives in the world of water. So what do you think more could be done from your perspective as a farmer? No, indeed, I think it's a very important and fair point because that's also connected with everything that we also are asking for in terms of, um, you know, uh, earlier I spoke about new technology, but we will have also to be trained how to use this new technology because that's definitely a thing. I mean, if, okay, they could be also expensive, so we can have investment support for that, but at the same time, we have to be trained to use this technology because they could be totally, I mean, far from what we learned in the past or... And also something very important I might say is as a farmer, most of the time what we are looking for is also what our neighbors are doing, you know. And I think also the peer-to-peer -peer learning is very important in terms of approach that we might have uh, as farmers because, you know, having some um, lighthouse farms or any kind of uh, um, pilot farms, any kind of things that you will uh, look at it uh, and that can, you know, be an example for other farmers, it's always important. And I, ex uh, personally, I, I'm part of a network called uh, Zero Defi, which is uh, Defi uh, Farms uh, in France. And so uh, we are for reducing fertilizer, but they have an impact on uh, water resources close to Montpellier because, you know, that's something that we are doing by, for example, uh, stopping using herbicides. So how do we do? Uh, sometimes also by, uh, you know, uh, le letting the grass grow during the, the entire year and stuff like that. So that's kind of thing that we are experimenting ourselves. And as farmer, uh, we are naturally experimentators. You know, we are ready to for adaptation most of the time. So I can, we can easily go in terms of uh, transformation or changes and stuff like that. But I think we, we, we have to be supported also at the same time because it's not easy uh, and you know, we are not making that much uh, income most of the time. So, you know, this has to be a challenge at the same time to, to be supported. And do you see a, a, um, a generational shift? I mean, obviously you're working, you're, you're representing young farmers. Uh, is there a sort of bit of a split in your industry and that the younger generation of farmers is, is much more um, aware and open to really taking the whole water uh, issue very seriously? I can say that in general, all farmers are committed to change eh? because I mean, when even if you are not a young farmer, the, you can see your children sometimes asking you to, to change a little bit your, your your practices. I mean, that's also a pressure that you can have even in your own family. I mean, eh? so I think that's it's something that we can see. Uh, uh, earlier, I think, uh, Clara, you, you spoke about the, the engagement of uh, the new generation also on the streets asking for more changes. And I believe that the commit, the engagement, the, the commitment that we can have as young farmers is definitely going this way. I mean, I mean, when we spoke all together, we, we are, I mean, 
the decline of biodiversity is it's really a thing we can experience it and i mean that's passed by uh, all the, the 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 things that we can change uh practices that we can do so i mean we are committed to change i mean that's definitely a shift i can see and not only for our generation i would say that's definitely i would say a sector in committed to change so if we're looking for for good practice examples of who's doing what um i mean Jeroen, from your perspective from an inspector what do you see as um something that works well in terms of uh, I, you know enforcing law that's there or, or just generally sort of um working well together to to self-regulate as well well some things do work very well in the field of course if it's like black and white legislation that's easy to enforce of course but it's it's very important to, to stress that the things that we do in the field is not only that the plain enforcement like writing fines and shutting down companies which are illegal but there's also a lot of compliance promotion to be done and and learning uh for the for the operators for instance sometimes it's it's very much amazing to see if you really explain why why this or that legislation is in place that, that there is there's some you, you really see in the field that there are a rising level of understanding of the operators for instance if they have to measure flows or water qualities or water levels and they do not really know why they are doing that a lot of operators think well they are doing that just to report it to some government who in turn has to report it to the eu and just check out the information out but if you tell them well look at your water quality analysis and if you see one parameter going down or you see your water levels dropping or you see other things well look at them yourself it's it's like self-monitoring we have to teach the operators and and really yeah getting getting letting them know what the legislation is in place for and once they they have that click so to speak then they're very happy so even well it's a minority but some operators are even happy that they are checked in the field because at that time they understand why these regulations is in place and i think that's also compliance promotion wise a very important part of our job we, we do in the field on a daily basis and do you think that then the, the sort of communicative softer approach is more effective than a heavy handed approach it's it's a, it's an important part of enforcement uh, they they have to go together you know it's not only the 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 compliance promotion because there is a lot of illegal activities in the field and and really the, 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 like they say in the drilling sector the rotten apples and the cowboys they have to go out and well you really have to go hard in on those uh but it's it's really the rotten apples and they 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 pollute the the rest of the of the apples for for the the rest of the sector so it's a combination of the two so we've talked a little bit about technology i mean technology can help farmers in terms of uh, using less water it can also uh, help the inspectors in terms of seeing what's going on in the field i mean there's huge potential isn't there particularly in the world of satellite technology um are you, are you i mean is this something that that uh, you're involved in at all well satellite imagery is being used dependent on the region in in europe of course because it's it's well fairly easy to use satellite imagery in in like spain or portugal to check whether or not fields are irrigated but that's of course less an issue in in the northern countries where there's a more rain so you cannot use satellite imagery but for instance what we are now uh, checking on in in belgium is like uh uh imposing gps tracking on drilling rigs so we can like really follow them live from the office where is this drilling rig going and where is it drilling and what kind of drilling is it doing just to make the work of the enforcement business uh, a lot easier so we do not have to really check all this paperwork to check which installation is useful to inspect so use technology and combine this technology with 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 tools uh like data mining tools because we are confronted on a daily basis with a lot of digital data coming in and and then it's it's, it's for an enforcement it's it's very difficult to 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 see the good from the bad data so it's it's modern technology in combination with data mining that's for in my opinion the way to go in the enforcement business and um, how do you feel about that samuel does that seem very big brother uh, to you to have a, a satellite spy in the sky yeah i, I mean <laughs> I, I will not be in favor to be always looking at uh, what i'm doing always but i, I can understand the uh, the idea of um, you know um having like following all the the action that we are doing on the field i i can understand the idea but i mean we have to be careful in terms of control and all the time i mean we have to keep also um you know the, some limits i will say uh because i mean we we i think we are actors of the ground that they are 
I mean, yeah, I mean, I, you know what I mean? I mean, we, do, we have yeah. to be careful of the way yeah. that we approach because yeah. we don't have to go too far. And even in terms of data, I mean, we have, I'm pretty often say that, but I mean, we own the data and I, I sometimes, and I want, if we make a data, that's, we have to be careful of what comes out with the data. So, so let me put, Paul, you're smiling at, at, at this. Tell, tell us your thoughts on this, because obviously this, you know, this is usually uh, EU um, satellites that are being used in this. Yeah, I mean, I think it is absolutely a fair point. I mean, we, you know, we, we work with people on the basis of trust. Yeah, I mean, the idea is is not that it's, uh, economic operators or farmers or whatever that they're always the bad guys. In my experience, I'd say you come across your percentages of all levels, and I think it's right. Often, you get many farmers. You know, they would teach me more than than I would necessarily know about what to do for the environment. And then you've got a whole group in the middle that would just follow the law perfectly normally. And then indeed, there are rotten apples, and it's this that you need to uh, to work on. Um, and I think it's you know, we've often used, when we use the satellites in our enforcement work, it's really in quite critical cases where, where we can really see that something, you know, pretty bad is going on. And then we add that on top to, um, as you know, to, to show to the court, for example, that, you know, really that illegal logging is taking place and these kind of things are more, but certainly not as a sort of a big brother uh, type thing. And we're very much, you know, we work in, we work in trust with the member states as well. The idea is, is that we, this is a joint, uh, a joint action uh, where we're all trying to get to the end of the same result in the end. Um, I mentioned at the beginning that um, the, the, the target is to have 100% of EU's freshwater ecosystems in good health by 2027, and it's only about 40% at the moment. So uh, a lot to be done. So where where could we make the biggest headway then? Um, if if we're talking about the legislation that's already there, or I mean, for instance, you, Carla, talked about the the mainstreaming of uh, the objectives of the water framework and other legislation. Um, do you think that could make a, a big difference? I mean, where do you see the biggest conflict in this? Um, well, yeah, um, I think uh, it can make a difference. And uh, I give you an example that has also to do with uh, data. Um, today, um, the pesticides regulation required farmers to have a kind of a bookkeeping system of uh, the quantity and the, the um, period they spray pesticides and uh, where in which crops, etc. This bookkeeping stays in the farmer's hands and is not communicated to the competent authority that is in general uh, agriculture competent authority in the member states. Uh, but water drinking water companies, they can request this information to the competent authority that doesn't have this information because it lies in the farmer's hands. So. This is, for instance, something that is very crucial for water companies to know when a substance and what kind of substance is put in the field, um, how much, because otherwise they cannot, uh, they don't know what to look for in yeah. the raw water in order then to follow in the drinking water to make sure the drinking water is safe. So uh, I think that there are very, that some legislation is there, it's not complete, we just need really to close the circle, I think. Right. Um, what would you say to that, Samuel, that there needs to be just this much better communication between um, the, the world of farming and I presume the world of, you're also saying, Carla, the world of industry as well, but uh, you know anybody who is uh, involved in an activity at a certain time that could affect the, 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 water, sh the water, surely the water authorities need to know. Yeah, that, that will open a lot of discussion. I will tell you why, because it's come back a little bit what we said earlier. Eh? I think we, we go back to transparency, trustability, and trust. So that's a lot of points. And for me, the, the best way to approach it will be to, to use something that is already existing, is to use all the, the certification already using. So, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm an organic farmer, so I'm certified. So that means I have an organism coming every year to inspect my, uh, my, my, you know, my use of pesticide. And so, if I go above the limits, uh, that means that uh, I know I'm, I know I'm not respecting the law, and so I think it, this should be the way that we might approach it, and not sharing all the information to everyone. I mean, we we also have to keep a little bit the way that we approach it, uh, because and using maybe an organism 
uh, coming on the farm and certif you know having all the certification i don't know exactly to explain that hey, you understand what i mean yeah. could be the best way to do it then uh, giving all the information to uh, water industry and all that stuff i, I mean that's also something that we, we might do uh, in terms of transparency and traceability because that will be better in in i mean my point of view as a farmer to do it this way uh, because uh, i mean that's that's fair it's it will be fair uh, in terms of uh, approaching because if you have somebody coming in your farm and certifying that you are respecting the law it's better than sharing the the amount of use of pesticide you you, you, you spray you know well, that's that will be my, my 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 opinion on this point. Okay, so you you ruin from the inspector's point of view. Do do you have any thoughts on this? And just generally, where you I mean, you say that there needs to be capacity building at local level, but what is that the the thing? What's going to really make some headway to get from forty percent to a hundred percent by twenty twenty seven in terms of, you know, uh, um, getting these laws and getting our waterways clean? Well, for groundwater, which is my specialty, that's, that may be a problem anyway, because some of these groundwater systems, they react really, really, really slowly. So they may be decades before they reach a good status. So 2027 will not be an option. But I do agree what Samuel said on, on accreditation and permitting. Uh, so I'm very much pro accreditation and permitting because these accreditation organizations are a surplus of enforcement, so to speak. But because I always compare having an accreditation or a permit to having a driver's license in Belgium, well, having a driver's license doesn't really necessarily mean you can drive a car. People prove that every time in the road. So you need these these cops or these these uh, photographs in the street to check on them. So we need a minimum inspection frequency on groundwater or on water uh, abstractions, whatever. If you cannot uphold this minimum frequency or cannot check it in the field, be it in the industry, be it be the farmers, be it pesticides, whatever. If you cannot uphold this minimum level of inspections, then well, there, there's your legislation, okay, but you can check it in the bin. Okay, um, we're coming to an end now, but I just want to know from uh, all of you, just very, 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 very briefly, I mean, one sentence. What needs to happen and how urgent is it? I mean, you know, uh, just I know this is really hard for you to it might probably something you've already said, but from your perspective, what's the most important thing that should happen tomorrow to to really improve compliance with water legislation or to improve the quality of our waters? Carla, what would you say? I would say the implementation of the polluter based principle and the cost recovery principle, because water bills can only pay for the drinking water that are in the urban waste with the treatment directive measures and not so much for the overall water cycle okay. protection. Okay, uh, Samuel, what would you say? I would say support in terms of um, uh, investments, uh, innovation and research, like I already said, but I think that will be the key for us uh, as farmers. Okay, and Jeroen? Well, in my field, I would say raising compliance promotion via raising groundwater awareness. Okay, and so Paul, what what are your what are your thoughts then? Okay, yes, I mean, I think on the whole, this is not the kind of a thing where you have a satisfying red lever and you pull it and everything goes yes. And yeah. it's like it's like one of those old movies where they set off the space uh, rockets and they press loads of different buttons. This is the kind of challenge we're facing. But I think one of the really key things that we still need to do is to to really work on some of the kind of in the member states that they have the right structures in place that are really, you know, designed to actually implement uh, properly. So this is a combination of willpower and sometimes it's organization, but I think this will be the thing. And then afterwards, all those buttons will get pressed. But for the moment, there are still a few to do. Uh. And and the fact that, the, the you know, we I mean, this is going right back to the beginning, so I'm not going to start all over again, but I mean, in terms of political will, there is a re seemingly a reluctance and um, why is water somehow water get, seems to almost get sort of forgotten at times as in terms of the legislature um, at national level? Why is that? Well, I think it partly because it's complex, partly because there are lots of interests that are, you know, maybe not so keen to make these changes. Um, so, but, I mean, it is improving, you know, I mean, the Green Deal, I think there has been a lot of awareness that this is such a crucial thing. Um, the, the recent droughts, I think we mentioned as, as, as a real tipping point. So it's improving, but we need to really uh, hurry up. 
we have to hurry up. I think that is that's a, a, a good phrase to to finish off. And uh, and the Green Deal. And we were hearing Jeroen actually in a session I was I was uh, moderating earlier about the Blue Deal in Flanders. So it's all very interesting that the there is there is some movement out there, isn't there? And it, it's very interesting. But and and I, your job, I think Jeroen does sound quite fascinating. Uh, uh, well, you are welcome to do it. We have vacancies, you know. <laughs> I'm not so sure about that. Anyway, thank you all very much indeed. Thank you to the organizers. That is it. It's the sense of urgency, I think, that that's really important. But thank you for all, all your different perspectives. And I think, you know, communication and transparency, as you said, Samuel, really, really important. Um, thank you to everybody for watching and have a, a good rest of Green Week. Bye bye.